Hi again, everybody. Welcome into another edition. This is Cross Functionality, the show connecting coaching, baseball, softball, male, female, hosted by former college baseball and softball players. And today we're talking hitting, everybody's favorite topic, right? It's all over social media all the time. Everybody loves talking about hitting and going at one another, certainly more on the baseball side than softball side, a little more toxic on the baseball side. But nonetheless, today we're talking episode 51 about bat and hand pats. Let me bring in the softball national champion at the University of Alabama and current day renowned coach, my friend and co-host, Cassie riley Bosha. What's going on, Cass? Nothing. I'm excited about this because I think it's very confusing for a lot of people and just excited to maybe bring some clarity for some people on it. You know, it's it's funny because um, with bat and hand path, we've got four points. There's so many things you could talk about with bat and hand path. Um, so many pointers you can bring up. We've narrowed it down to four main key points today we're going to talk about when it comes to bat and hand path, but a lot of hitting in general. You and I were talking about this before we went live. A lot of hitting in general nowadays with all the new technology, all of the new metrics. Some of it has now oversaturated the market. Technology has convoluted pretty much everything when it comes to hitting. And it is sort of we're forced together certain terminologies when it comes to hitting bat path, hand path. That's no different. Technology of sort of, has sort of put those two together, and a lot of people now don't really understand what the difference is between the two and how they could actually help that hitter progress forward. Sure, and you know, a lot of the times when we're talking about coming up with topics, it, it comes from conversations I've had with parents or if I had with athletes or with, with coaches, and I think where technology has probably brought clarity to the upper 1%, so like people who can hire data scientists and people who have biomechanists on staff that can actually bring clarity to some of these top-end metrics or find correlations or find, hey, when this is here, this means this. Um, other than that, all technology has done is is made parents feel like, oh my gosh, look at all these things I could get off blast, and I don't know what half of them mean. Um, am I supposed to max all of these out? Am I supposed to find an optimal zone? Um, and so I think it's just, it, it has very much so muddied the water. So anyway, I got this question from a parent a little while ago and it was just, um, I had hoped to, you know, you could go as you could, you could go to Google Scholar and make this a highly, highly technical, nerdy conversation, or you can kind of just say, okay, listen, here are the, the nuts and bolts to understanding it and how you could potentially apply it to your athlete. Yeah. Join us on this show and yeah. we'll, we'll, break, we'll break it down for you. Hopefully you can help out some hitting coaches today. Be sure to follow us on social media at Jim Tara. Um, on both platforms and at coach underscore Cassie RB on Instagram at coach Cassie RB on Twitter and be sure to email us your questions to Jimbo podcast 21 at gmail.com yeah I mean with technology too, the blast motion that's personally my favorite I don't know how you feel about that as a coach but blast motion technology I think is probably the most parent friendly and just casual type friendly when it comes to the metrics easiest to learn what those metrics might mean but there are a lot of metrics out there, and I think parents oftentimes will get overwhelmed with trying to hit that certain metric, and then now the mechanics that you need to have to be a successful hitter go out the window, like, say, a bat path and a hand path, because the ultimate goal is to try to hit a certain number, as we've talked about many times on this show and what technology has done, for not so much for the better, but for the worse when it comes to baseball and softball. Yeah, and, it, and if you're looking for more in-depth places, if you're one of those parents or coaches who's willing to take the deep dive, uh, Blast has a ton of information on their site with videos. Um, I think, you know, what Blast did a great job of is, hey, he, you know, they basically put um, these three categories together and said, okay, you're just going to try to achieve the green um, in these categories. But then when you're not achieving, the issue I think became when you weren't achieving green, maybe you were green in two or yellow in one, whatever it may be all of a sudden you wanted to take a deeper dive and be like, okay, well, what do I have to do to get to green now? What do I have to work on? Why is this not showing up that way? Um, I think that it got a little confusing. And then Driveline Baseball did a great thing. If you go to Driveline Baseball's website, they have a great, you know, predominantly known for pitching, but they have a great hitting section, um, a ton of biomechanists on staff, and they do a pretty good job of taking deep dives on topics and then uh, bringing it to a uh, more communication level of speaking. Uh, so, I'll, you know, I, I think they do a great job breaking down those blast metrics as well. So if there's something that you want to take a deep dive on. But I think I think just the overarching point is how it is interesting to break down the swing in these ways. But the hands are not going to move without the aid of the body, right? Like the, the bat is not going to move without the aid of everything else going on beforehand. So, yes, it is neat to look at these two. But if we have massive issues with something else going on, in our, you know, the, the, the trunk, the main part of our body that is going to dictate our hand path, our bat path more. Every, everything happens all together. It's very hard to just 
look at one little piece and be like, ah, okay, this is it. Even though that's what I really want to be doing. <laughs> Cause and a lot of it applies to what that hitter may need to work on. It's an individualized right. type program. I, you know, t- talking about, we're going to talk about sequencing here in a second, mm-hmm. but let, let's first discuss from your perspective, the difference between bat and hand path and how they correlate with one another. So we're talking about the differences, but how they both can go together to be able to get on plane properly with that pitch, both baseball and soft. Sure. And and we've talked about, you know, pillars of the swing. And one of the most important ones is, is getting on plane and staying on plane with that ball. Um, so you have your your hand path, right? So that you're looking at what do, what are my hands actually doing in the swing? And a lot of times to take a video, even just to get an understanding, you might videotape and pause it. And let's say you're in coach's eye or a free app like Huddle. You put a little dot where the hands were. And then you move it two frames over and you put another dot. And now you're starting to see hey, wait a second, this is the the angle. My, my hands are essentially making a circle around my body and my bat is following that similar circle around my body, but it's just maybe a little delayed. Um, I think the biggest piece is when we, uh, sometimes when we try to over, when we try to rush things or when we try to maybe move out of sequence, uh, all of a sudden that path looks very funky. It doesn't look this nice, smooth uh, rotation around our body. So the thing that um, blast motion gives us too is uh, bats, uh, uh, hand speed, right? Like how fast did your hands move? And I think what people often misconstrue is you don't necessarily want to max out your hand speed. And if you try to really rush your hands, you're going to throw sequencing off. You're going to throw your swing off and it's going to look very funny. Our, our, the, the, the whippiest or most efficient swing, right? Might be a slower hand path that results in a better bat velocity or more optimal bat velocity for you. You know, one cue you can think of as a hitter or as a parent out there or as a coach listening to this anytime a hitter fouls a pitch say i'm I'm coming from a baseball perspective here, but fouls a pitch off i'm, I'm picturing it in my head almost like i'm in the batter's box right now. that's why i'm not looking at the camera um they foul that pitch off straight back a pitch that's belt high or below or below you know knees to the belt lower portion of that zone they foul it straight back to the screen People will say and correctly will assess that that's a timing issue mm. when or I'm sorry, a, a um, a, you know, a, a timing issue. OK, when it's a higher pitch and they foul it off, say, straight back again to the screen. That's more of a hand path or swing plane type issue. So my point is that bat path and hand path are vitally important, especially though you can test your bat and hand path. And what it may be, what it looks, what it may look like if you need to work on it a little bit more on a pitch that's a little bit up because you're fouling a pitch straight back. That's not that that's a swing plane issue. That's not oftentimes it's not a timing issue because if it was a timing issue, you'd you'd foul it off to the opposite field. Again, left hand batter. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And you see what I'm saying? So and you're a left handed batter as well, so you understand, you know, where I'm coming from with that. Mm -hmm. But if it's you foul pitch straight back, that's that's a little bit higher up in the zone. That's more of a bad path and swing plane issue. In my right, opinion, right. Like, my like humble opinion. Underneath, right, your plane is off by like a, a centimeter, right? Something, something off like that. So, yeah, and and I think to the the awareness of what's going on, I'll have hitters uh, close their eyes with no bat in their hand, and I say, okay, show me your swing, and they'll go th- and I'll videotape and have them go through it. And I have them open their eyes. I say, look at your hands now. Go through what you think your swing should be doing. I'll have them put a bat in their hand, and I'm just trying to see, okay, what is their interpretation of of what this should look like versus what's actually going on, and. Um, one of my favorite drills growing up was whenever I felt like my my hand path was negatively impacting my swing plane, where it was I was really almost trying too hard with it, um, was throwing a bat right like right into the net, you know, nothing sure. nothing crazy, but just you know like okay, like it should feel that whippy, it should feel that relaxed. That this is the direction I want things to be going, um, and so there are different medicine ball drills. There's different just for feel. Again, it's not. We're not trying to tell a hitter, well, your palm has to be here. Your po- other palm has to be here. It's just, listen, this is the direction of, of, of where our plane uh, needs to go. Our hands need to go in order to dictate that swing plane. And, and I think those types of, of things will start to lead a hitter to better understand, okay, this is what's actually happening, not, you know, I need to come this way or I need to do this because it puts a lot of pressure on, on the body, I think, to function in a robotic way instead of a smooth, whippy pattern. And it sounds like what you're talking about there is more feel versus versus real, which we'll yes. we'll get to yeah. in, in a second here. I just want to talk about sequencing. A lot of hitters don't know that ultimately what their body is doing on any good swing that they may have 
Anytime they hit a home run, especially, their body sequence perfectly in that moment. How does hand path and bat path fit into the sequence of the swing? All right, and I think that's what's so interesting is they come at the end of the sequencing. Um, and so the a really good way to think of sequencing is our our hip or our our spinal engine, right? Like we're, like our lower half is driving a lot of the swing, right? Um, so if, if, if our body was running a race to the finish line, it would look like about halfway through the swing, it would look like our hips are winning because our belt buckle is facing the pitcher and our torso is now starting to turn our ribs, right. Are starting to face the pitcher and our hands are all the way back here. And not only that, our barrel. So I'm, when I say my bat, I'm going to reference just the barrel. My barrel is really far behind, right? So this is that optimal point where it looks like, is the hitter actually going to make it? And what happens when a hitter is strong, when they have proper sequencing, is that that torso grabs onto the hip and pulls itself forward. And, and the lat will now pull it, be able to pull the arms forward. So all of a sudden, we're moving in a sequential order. That is what sequencing is. If at any point we over uh, overuse our hands, we have too tight of a grip and our hands end up in front of our hips. Well, we just lost all that power we tried to generate from our hips. Um, it didn't transfer, essentially. Um, so if we start to get out of sequence, if our hands again, start to take over, what you're going to start to see is it almost looks like the hitter is, is cranking that top hand around at contact. And it's, it, instead of it being this smooth whip where the barrel comes around last, the barrel is going to start to beat the hands to the ball. And now we have the ordering is off, right? Our hands didn't win the, uh, win the race or our hands didn't get there first. Um, so that's, I guess, a, uh, Sequencing can be c confusing, but if you just think of it as like, okay, I want my lower half to kind of move first and, and pull everything else along, that is, that's exactly how it should feel and how it should look. Yeah, so you're saying hips leading the hands almost. That the, sounds the old, right. <laughs> the old Bud Williams theory. When you say that bat path and, and hand path, um, they're not the same for, for every hitter. How do you decipher what kind of bat path and hand path might fit that specific hitter individually um okay so i guess some glaring um because i'd say generally it it should look moderately similar um however you're gonna have some hitters who uh are righty throwers but they hit lefty and so the way they get their hands to a pathway let's say so anybody who knows throwing knows okay i'm gonna have more layback on my throwing arm than i am my non-throwing arm so if they are hitting lefty their left arm is not used to being in layback. So their ability to maybe get their elbow and their, their lat into a certain position is not the same as someone who has thrown on their back arm side. So we just have to potentially make some modifications. They might need to have their hips open a little bit more, whatever it may be, in order to have a moderately efficient and and, and uh, optimal, if you will, because it's good. Optimal is is uh, depends on the, on the person, right? but optimal hand path uh, to get to the ball. If not, what's going to happen is our hand path is going to start to adjust based on our physical limitations. Mm -hmm. So we have, con conversely, let's say we do throw with our left arm and we're a lefty hitter, and my left arm is so incredibly sore from throwing, my body will automatically change my hand path for me, thus impacting my bat path, just to avoid that soreness and avoid some of that pain. So... It's, it's not necessarily that it's different person to person, but the way we work on it with an athlete is going to be completely different person to person for sure. So interesting, interesting here. I want to ask how, when you look from your, in your perspective, right, you look through the lens of you as a hitting coach, because mm -hmm. you see things differently as a hitting coach on hitters that other people do not. What, that's just the nature of the beast, by the way, and anything I think in life, but what do you see? When a hitter has a bad, I don't, uh, for lack of a better term, or an adequate bat and hand pat, what sticks out to you right away first as a hitting coach that says that's not a good or ideal bat path and hand path we need to fix? Sure. Uh, okay. So, and I'm going to say, like, I will have an alarm go off in my head first, and then I will shut up for a while because, and, and here's the reason why, because I don't, I don't want to just look at the hitter and be like, I found something that looks off. That's easy to do. Um, so a couple of things, uh, they might go into an early arm bar, right? So they're trying to create space around their body. So instead of having this direct pathway to the ball or in, into like their their plane where they they start to get that bat ready in the plane, maybe they'll start to arm bar first and then that rotation starts to happen. Or maybe they have almost a Derek Jeter-esque look where they're going to, I mean, when he was like maybe really trying to get inside of a ball, 
where their front elbow is going to like hike really high up because they're fighting so hard to get around the turn of their body. Okay, so I say that with a grain of salt, right? So I might look at those things and be like, that doesn't look as smooth or direct as we potentially wanted to. Now, I had this conversation with a couple hitters who are both Division One baseball players, and we talked about how slower pitching or, or uh, worse pitching, if you will, like the yeah. non-elite pitching, there's so much more you can get away with, right? You can, you can do a couple of these inadequate bat path things and really get away with it, um, and then as pitching gets better, that's when it really eats you alive, where if you're not on point and as efficient as you can conversely if your vision is top notch well essentially you have just made better pitching that not seem as good right because your vision is so good for interpreting balls so yeah if, if you are maybe like a Bryce Harper or you're like some of these elite of elites that have this unbelievable interpretation of an incoming ball maybe you can get away with a couple of these inefficiencies and maybe we shouldn't just be looking at major league baseball players and being like ah Everything about their swing is what we should blanket to everyone else. So anyway, I, I I look at those things and then I look and see, okay, is this working for them? And why why are they doing this? Are they doing this because they have some type of physical limitation or are they doing this because their timing is off and they're trying to either slow themselves down to, to connect with the ball well or they need to speed themselves up to connect with the ball because they're late. Um, so that's, I guess, the how I'm starting to view it. But it but a really great hitter, what it's going to look, it's going to seem like this effortless flow, almost like a little like a Ken Griffey Jr.-esque smoothness to it where you're like, okay, that doesn't seem like we have any glitches there. That looks that looks very direct to the ball, very short to it um, type feel. And I know that was long-winded, but that that is what my brain process is going through. <laughs> so, let, so if I can, I'll counter one thing when you say sure. that some of the major league hitters do get away with some of their inadequacies. Pitching has never been better at the major league level. Mm-hmm. We can argue that, right? I mean, probably be right most of the time with that. So major league hitters, while yes, at times they may run into a ball, right? Old baseball speak. Most times they have to be very tightened with their mechanics. And one of those things is, has to be bat path and hand path. Right? For sure. So they have figured out that's what works essentially best for them. All I'm saying is that it shouldn't be what every young hitter Every young hitter shouldn't necessarily look at um, uh, Trout and be like, oh, my back foot has to kick backwards. Like, that works re- really well for him, for him. But, again, you look at his his bat path, he's on plane, he stays on plane. They, they are figuring out their bodies um, in the, it, as far as what works best for them. Um, right. And it's just going to be – it's going to be different. That's all it is. It's going to be different for person to person because, they again, they figured that out. How does bat speed and bat quickness, how does that relate now to bat path and, and hand path? And personally, you and I have talked about this. I'm more of a bat quickness guy, launch mm-hmm. to contact the speed from which you get to one point to the other rather than just swinging the bat with velocity. It doesn't mean you're wrong or you're not a good player or if you believe bat speed is better, it doesn't necessarily make you wrong. It's just not something that I put at the top of the list. I'd rather have the bat quickness. So how does bat quickness, bat speed, how does that relate to bat having good even better than good, but an above average bat path and and um, and hand path. Sure. Uh, so this is going to be this is actually an interesting thing to do with your hitters. Um, and if you're uh, even throwing, if you're trying to measure um, our uh, how hard they throw, so you you say to them, okay, listen, like you get them warmed up, they're all ready to go. Okay, I want you to swing at fifty percent, and you're measuring their bat speed, you're measuring their exit velocity. And then you say, okay, cool. That looked great. Let's crank it up a little bit, maybe 65%. Go from there. And then you maybe, you just start, listen, like some hitters are going to be able to crank dial this up. Some hitters are going to go too hard at the gate, whatever it is. You're trying to dial it up. And then you get to a point, you say, okay, great. We've done this 85%. Let's say, let's go 100%. Let me see what this looks like. And you you start showcasing those values. And you start to showcase that they're best bat speed and their best exit speeds are happening at 85%, not 100%. And the reasoning for that is you're getting your best sequencing off, right? So if we were just trying to move your bat as fast as humanly possible, we would re- we would organize our body differently. But because we're trying to move our bat as fast as possible while still making contact with the ball, that's what you're talking about. That quickness comes into play. The accuracy comes into play. We might, ne- you know, we might sacrifice a mile or two on max velocity in order to get the best output we possibly can because a lot of my hitters will start to get, okay, I swung that bat very hard, but I didn't hit the ball very hard. <laughs> I miss hit it, right? My mechanics broke down. 
Um, and that's what we're really trying to figure out. I, I have some athletes, though. I have some phenomenal, and I say athletes because they can be an all-state quarterback and then they can go play hockey and then they can be an all-American in baseball and they'll pick up a bat and go 100% and still have high quality swing contact. They are, they're just at a different level. But for most people, we are going to operate in this, this realm that, um, the harder we try to force something, the less optimal we move, thus actually the slower we end up moving. Um, and, and that's really what we want to try to avoid. Yeah. When you talk feel versus real, and again, Mm -hmm. today's episode talking bat path and hand path, trying to decipher through the four main points, if you will, um, talking about bat path and and hand path. And if you have any questions, email us, dreambowpodcast21 at gmail.com. Feel versus real. How does that relate when it comes to bat path and Mm -hmm. and hand path? Sure. So uh, I I remember coming up, so this is like 2004. um, So this is before we had like Twitter that we could go and search or oh, we had myspace baby yeah we we did but there wasn't a lot of hitting <laughs> conversations on that <laughs> but i had a i had a coach who um would say okay i want you to be very calm in the box you're going to raise your hands up and then you're going to swing down across the zone because you're giving yourself a better chance of making impact with the ball and when you do make impact on the ball it'll be a back swing style or back spin style and that's how you're going to hit and i was like Okay, that makes sense. You know what I mean? It, in the, in a strange way, instead of being like, no, 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 you're gonna try to it, meet the moment of impact directly instead of just skimming through the ball, right? So, interestingly enough, though, when you watched video of people swings, nobody gets in the box and swings straight down, and yet still, you watch Major League Baseball players, you watch Alex Rodriguez on MLB Network saying, "I come from here, and I'm I'm trying to get back bat spin on back goodness back spin on the ball by swinging down." And yet you look at his swing and he never swung down. But in his head, that's what he had to do in order to get on plane with the ball. So we have so much of this, again, feel that has come from language of hitters. Um, And then we have actually real what's going on because we can not only just watch high-speed video, but we can get these biomechanical trackers hooked up to hitters and be like, wait a second, no, we're getting on plane. We're, We're almost flattening out before we start to rise. Um, At no point are we really necessarily swinging down. Um, especially after contact. So, um, this is, this is one of those situations where if you have a hitter with this immense uppercut and leans too far back, yeah, you might have them do like a Barry Bonds drill where they try to swing straight down on a ball and it'll level out their swing like crazy just to do that a couple of times. And you're like, okay, that doesn't mean this is a bad drill. Even if this is actually not what's going on at the swing, this is just what the athlete has to feel in order to produce an optimal that path so again as coaches and whether you're working with athletes or just having a conversation online I think this has to be at the forefront of your mind that this is we are never going to have a perfect cue that suffices how someone feels and what is actually going on in this in the swing this is going to just be dependent hitter to hitter Um, and I think that hand path and bat path understanding is is often misconstrued when it comes to that you know um another guy too uh, Derek Jeter used to do it in the on deck circle all the time where he would swing straight down tony Gwynn. there's video of him all this video out there of him talking about what his feels were and he actually thought he was doing that but when you get him on video he wasn't doing any of that um mm-hmm. so he took the, that feel part uh, and this kind of goes away from bat and hand path but he kind of took that feel part of what he was doing at the plate um and really tried to apply it even though he wasn't really doing it at all and again it, it's that mental Thing, right it's that mental mm-hmm. push and pull that that you know I'm, i feel like i'm doing this right the feel but in reality you're you're not doing that right you know? and and i think the biggest most important thing as a coach is if you had a feel cue that worked really really well for you that's awesome but you got to know that's not going to work for every single one of your hitters and that's cool you could have it in your back pocket and be like you know what maybe maybe think about this you know i i used to try to hit a ground ball to shortstop if i was facing a high spin rate pitcher that was throwing outside and that worked really well for me but that is not what works well for a lot of athletes athletes with similar swings to me it it works well for but that's again you don't want to actually feel like you're swinging down on top of the hole but again it it works it does wonders for people someone who comes really far forward in their swing that doesn't work well for them at all (laughs) right 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 um most important point before we wrap up today's episode ne- next week episode 52 tips for working with young hitters we're going to give mm-hmm. those tips out next week working with younger type hitters um 
some of the things that I think that we're talking about today probably probably can't teach to a younger hitter, or at least um, you have to reword it, right? But we'll talk about that next. Well, time. yeah, you wouldn't want them knowing that you were working on it with them. <laughs> um, final point, though, bat and hand path today. What do you think the most two most important points when it comes to bat and hand path would be for all coaches that have to listen to this now and understand what bat and hand path does for a hitter if done correctly? Sure. So uh, everyone's optimal hand path, which dictates bat path, is going to uh, vary depending on uh, depending on things. So don't don't rush to get caught up in, oh, this is wrong. We have to fix it because the athlete is doing that for a reason. Let's figure out why they're doing it. Um, and then let's figure out, okay, is this limiting them or is this just how they're essentially timing up a ball, right? Um, I, I, and then I think really the second point is uh, that real versus feel. So when you are then in the position of, okay, we need to correct something or we need to work on something, am I? Um, is it necessary to explain what is actually going on in the swing? Or am I just providing a cue that is going to get this athlete to fall into that position that I, that I, I want them to or to achieve something that I want them to? Um, so I, I, I think that probably lends then to understanding that their hand path and bat path will likely be off because of something else going on in their swing. And we cannot just ever train one thing independently. We have to constantly ask ourselves questions. Is this happening because something's going on with their hips? Is this happening because something else? So um, just constantly be curious about a hitter and about a swing and not fall into this is the perfect one this is you and these are the differences and we have to fix 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 right right overwhelming the athlete right oh gosh yeah 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 for sure yeah you probably probably seen coaches do that many times right i i probably did it myself especially when i first started you know it's 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 a blessing and a curse to know a lot about the swing and then all of a sudden you have to know a lot about people and then you got to know a lot about kids um and how they respond to certain things so yeah it's that's the last thing you want to do (laughs) yeah um do you have anything to promote before we head on out of here no i just i got i got my hitting library so i have an entire uh section of my hitting library about 165 drills dedicated purely to bat speed um and bat quickness um and if you have if you're someone who feels like you are struggling with trying to either regulate your your bat plane um or regulate your bat speed i think that would probably be a helpful tool for you so you can definitely check that out all right um if anybody has any um or wants to inquire about any podcast or multimedia opportunities email me jimbo podcast 21 at gmail.com and we can discuss further again jimbo podcast 21 at gmail.com if you're a small business or a business in general any multimedia and podcast opportunities they are here for you Email us, jimbopodcast21 at gmail.com. Thank you for listening and watching, everybody. Be sure to subscribe to the Softball Strength Academy YouTube page. Don't forget about that either on YouTube. And subscribe on Apple, Google, Spotify, and we'll talk to you next time.